Welcome everybody to the Monday Motivation Spotlight. I'm Leslie Kaplan, welcoming you here today as every Monday with our co-host ACI in order to bring you inspiring and motivating guests who are making a difference, especially during this challenging time for I'm Israel. As you know, for those of you that are new, this program was started, the Monday Motivation Spotlight, was started at the beginning of the war, two weeks after the war started, in order to, number one, give exposure to amazing business owners, individuals, and organizations who are making a difference, and on the other hand, to keep inspiring and motivating us when we hear people's stories, as well as giving us a safe place to meet for 30 minutes every single Monday, whether you meet with your camera on or off, and of course, you can stay muted throughout the entire time. Although this part is not a networking forum, remember that you are, if you're a business owner, feel free to share your details in the chat, which you're welcome, but to keep yourselves on mute. And today, if you're joining live, it's a double event. So stay with us. I will officially at 9.25 end this first half, but we don't disconnect from the Zoom. I just end the recording. And then we have a five minute break and then we're leading into our second half with the amazing Hadas Levy, who is going to be sharing with us about websites and how we can maximize our business activities and our website. But before we start, I'm going to now spotlight our guest for our Monday Motivation Spotlight, my friend Yael Kanner, who I've known probably for about 12, 13 years, Yael, if I have to think back. Yael is a bundle of energy for anyone that knows her, an entrepreneur, always got a new vision up her sleeve, so what and who is Yael? Firstly, Yael lives in Malaya Domim, and I'll start with the end, and more recently since the war, she and an amazing team, some who are here, have taken on cooking for soldiers and cooking for other people, and that's with her background as a professional chef slash caterer, as well as having cooked and done soup. I don't know if you want to call it soup kitchens, but cooked and made soups for people, needy people, even before the war. That's after her background. She's a resilient coach. She's a doula. She was one of the first Mashki Hort slash kosher supervisors in the USA. And she also had an exciting career as a Sparadi Rabbanit in a couple of different cities in the US. So Yael, share with us, good morning, I'm delighted to welcome you here today. Share with us about your exciting background, career, I'm Israel, and Kola Kabod with all this energy and making a difference, you know, to and for so many people. Take it away. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you so much for inviting myself and my team here. Um, what I wanted to tell you about is um, I never expected to make Aliyah. Um, my early life gave no indication. Um, I was raised on a farm on the border of Maine and New Hampshire, and um, there wasn't uh, any Jewish community there. So um, I was pretty much the only Jew. And throughout high school, um, I actually dated a um, Protestant minister's son. And so... <laughs> And his father had been to Yale and studied Hebrew and knew Torah, you know, or at least knew the first book. Um, and he and my father had a gentleman's agreement that we would never end up together. And um, what happened is by the time I was 16 years old, I had had enough of being um, the solo Jew. And I left and I went to university and I went to um, the larger city in Massachusetts, which is Worcester. And I went to Clark University. And that was the first time that I ever met Jews. Um, when uh, the holidays rolled around, I went my first time in a reform shawl and I thought mm, kind of left me cold. You know, um, they had something they called the Rolling Stones, which is um, the Ten Commandments rolled back and forth you know, to open the ark. <laughs> it was very dramatic. Um, okay, so that that didn't suit me. Um, I got involved with Hillel and actually um, there was a rabbi with a hat that came towards me with this big long stick and he's walking towards me and um, he says, you want to shake a lulav? I said, shake a what? I had no idea what a lulav was. <laughs> um, and so that was the beginning of my journey. And getting involved in Hillel um, gave me a roommate and a roommate that had just come back from a year course, had spent a year at Kibbutz Keturah. And um, she really put me on the on the path. I had no clue. Milchik, Fleishik, I didn't know any of it. Um, so 
I was very, I changed my major to Jewish studies. And um, then what happened is um, I finished and I went to Wurzweiler and I met my, on the first day, this very charismatic young rabbi. And um, we ended up getting married and we stayed married for 24 years. And then we got divorced. And um, then uh, I was alone for about two years. And then I remarried uh, almost 20 years ago. And so had the experience of blending a family. My, the husband that I married the second time, Yosef, he had lived for most of his life, most of his adult life in Israel. Um, he had only gone back to America um, to make money because um, they were having a hard time making it here. And so it turned out that he had an apartment in Malia Dimim and uh, we started talking when we were going out. And I'm like, I've always wanted to live in Israel. And the first husband said, oh, we'll save up, we'll save up. And it was like never enough. And um, the second husband said, yeah, I want to go home. And so uh, we were thinking we'll go north. And then he said, I have a house in Malia Dimim. I said, Ooh, tell me more. <laughs> so um I walked into this house because we basically I basically walked out on a fabulous job. I was a chef at a hotel and I walked out on this job after eight years of being there in this amazing situation and um came to Malia Dameem. And when I walked into the apartment, it's like my body and my soul were finally like in the same place. I was so fulfilled being here. Every day has been a bracha. Um I had a chance to try a lot of things because I never stopped trying. And so um, I was able to fulfill a dream and go to seminary for a year and a half in Jerusalem. Um, I was able to join the Mishmar Ezrahi, which is the um, the local sort of um, police auxiliary organization. I just tried whatever I wanted to. And um, and I built a business. I built a, a sweet little business called Bubby on Call. And I was able to go around the country and and uh, support moms and families. And um, people would go on vacation, leave me their kids. And uh, it was phenomenal. So until COVID came along. And the first week of COVID, unfortunately, um, one of my sons uh, chose to end his life. And so that was a, a big blow, a big, big blow to come back from. Um, but I gave myself about six to eight weeks. And then I started um, learning at the Jerusalem Coaching Institute with Dr. Leia and um, Leia Ganesh. And so like from there, I started getting tools, tools for resilience. And so one of the first things you do when you are studying coaching is they ask you to do a personal inventory. And the personal inventory takes takes a like a spiritual, a cheshbon and nefesh of, of your skills, your strengths, your abilities, things that you like to do in the past, things that you want to do in the future, your lifetime achievements, um, all kinds of things that get you to look back and see what kinds of um, experiences you've been through that you can, things that you can use in yourself to overcome whatever your current challenges are. Um, I never saw, obviously never saw suicide in my, uh, on my bingo card. Um, and I never saw, you know, divorce, remarriage, but, you know, I, all these things make you stronger or you use different things. So by learning how to navigate, you know, your child's mental health issues, uh, going through the grief process and understanding it, um, you know, blending a family, all these things became tools. Um, and I learned tools from, from Dr. Leia um, about how to navigate all of this and then obviously how to share it and how to um strengthen other people you know based on what i've learned um different exercises so when aliyah came along um that turned out to be a very soft klita um from having the apartment and having no um as as i've learned no mortgage is like the golden ticket here um the hardest thing about Aliyah was the language because I struggle. Um, I've learned disabilities, calcolexia, you know, a couple of other um, ADD, which I didn't even know until Dr. Leia pointed out. She said, you might want to investigate this. Okay. Um, because I'm always, obviously I'm trying new things because, you know, people who have ADD crave novelty. So that's me. I, I get bored doing the same old thing. Um, so, 
all of these things that went into Aliyah, um, what happened is when we came, we sort of made it a sort of we made it a mission that um, we would uh, help young people. And um, because all of our uh, seven, uh, six of our seven children were in America and only one is here in Yerushalayim. And um, so what happened is we became a de facto um, sort of Chabad house, just an open door. Um, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say to my husband, who's here? Because I never know who's in the beds. Um, and so it started out with uh, my original Ben Bayat when I was a Rebbitzin in Washington called me up and said, you know, I, I had a kid, he's at Shalabim, he's 15, it's his first time, you know, away from home, will you host him? Well, we had Mendy and Mendy was our gateway drug. Mendy brought everybody from Shalabim into our life. Amazing, amazing. So we, we've uh, had a very good relationship for the past seven years with the rabbis there. And and um, every year we get new kids. Um, and that uh, that was like the beginning of having just a really super open house. And so now these boys are now soldiers. Um, the I, the next group that's going to draft in drafts in in November. So they come and they live with us on, during the times that because they're lone soldiers, they don't have a home base. If the machina is closed, they're out of luck. So um, so they've come and many of them have lived with us. And now we've gone through just a batch of weddings this past year. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, but that brings me to the soldiers. So I lost my son, navigated that, you know, navigated COVID, you know, hung tight to my principles for COVID. And then um, along came the war. And so I have to use what's in myself um, to overcome this. Um, I do tend towards being uh, more on the anxious side. So I've had to learn more about mindfulness and, and practice these principles and, and reach out for help when I need it. Um, you know, um, I'm very, for some reason, I'm very triggered by the ambulances. Um, and for some reason, my house, Hashem, decided should be over Kfishahat. So I hear ambulances morning, noon, and night. Um, but I say to myself, oh, they're having a baby. They're having a baby. So you have to use what you got. Um so basically the what happened is when my son died, I opened up the soup gamach and I decided that I would give soup to the 40,000 people that are in Malaya Dumim. Anybody who needed soup, if they were sad, if you were sick, if you were, if you can't make it to payday, you know, this is where you, where you come to and we'll fill up your bag and, you know, hopefully fill you up spiritually. Um, when the war came, we expanded it and I started doing something which I hadn't done before, which was um, actively fundraise. And um, so I'm using my skills inside myself that I had from being a Revitson because we built a shul and that's a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, connecting and networking, and I have to do that again. <laughs> Only I'm doing it for my soldiers. So, um, so basically, what I do is at the beginning of the week, I share what happened. You know what um, what I sent out that week, what the team did. We have um, a group of probably about 10, 10 volunteers or so that regularly cook for three hundred and fifty guys. Um, and the food has gone north to Lebanon and the food has gone into Gaza. Um, we regularly take care of four tank units. <clears throat> and um, we send out really high quality Mahadran, mostly, um, food. And, um, and it has to be ready to be eaten but it also has to be frozen because of obviously the heat. So we're, we're um, we're doing a huge amount of work every single week. And it is has become a full-time job. I don't need a job because I'm working literally minimum three eight-hour days of just cooking. And um, I should mention that my um, my kitchen is actually the size of a bathtub. It is so tiny. It's one of the little gallery kitchens. And people say, oh, I want to come. I want to cook with you. I'm like, where would I put you? <laughs> so... Well, um, you do have a big oven. I do remember you have an American-sized oven, right? Oh, it's beyond American. When I was a professional chef at the hotel in Maryland, I had a huge stove. It was like one of those, you know, 
commercial ovens. Well, I said to my husband when we first came here that um, that I wanted to have a decent size oven because the Israeli one was extremely frustrating. I, I lasted maybe three, four months. And then we went into the bank and we said, you know, can we can we have a loan for this oven? Um, and I never knew that I was going to need it so much. Um, it's it's commercial size. Um, it literally swamps the whole kitchen. Um, but over the years, well, first of all, my husband had the foresight when we were coming here to put on our lift all of these commercial stainless steel um, tables. He built me a custom kitchen. Um, much uh, He basically took the kitchen that I had at the hotel and shrunk it down. So overhead, I have a pot rack. Um, it's very hard if you're taller than five feet like myself. <laughs> the guys routinely bang their head on it. Um, and uh, over the years, someone gave me a freezer and then I brought a freezer from America. And every single week I fill up a chest freezer and I fill up standing freezer and then a refrigerator. I always say that my refrigerator, you can hide a body in. So it's like huge. <laughs> and that gets completely filled up. Um, and everything has to go in frozen. Uh, the only thing I send in fresh are the, is the rice because that would be an affront to the rice to, to freeze it. It would be good. Um, but we tried it for the high quality. We try, because I figured these guys can't call Uber. So every week I do either a Chinese menu or this week I'm doing Greek, two kinds of Greek chicken. Um, we do, I take all of the Sephardic um cooking that, uh, you know, the recipes that I learned from my congregants who were Iraqi and Moroccan and Syrian. Uh, and for some reason, my twisted sense of humor loves to make Lebanese and Syrian food because I figure as long as they're in the neighborhood, they should enjoy the local cuisine. <laughs> so so that that's uh, one of the things that I do. And we're sending out, when I first started, we were sending out four bags of food. And now I think we're up to like 13 or 14 of just mine um, when I line it all up. And um and I've got it down to a so like for example today I will start backwards you know do the the carbs and all that kind of stuff get that in the freezer then um the meat comes tomorrow and when I say meat we're talking um between eighteen and twenty pounds uh, uh twenty kilos sorry kilos that's more um worth of meat arrives at our house every week and um it gets cooked off and then frozen um. So and, how, do you get it out to the bases or to soldiers in the area or they come to you? How do you distribute them? We have the most amazing women. We have um, Yehudit Lynn Bloom and we also have Esther um, Lerman Cohen. And Esther is fearless. They said to her, okay, you have to come north, but they weren't going to send a truck to meet her. So we load up Esther's little, you know, uh, sedan, pack it with food. And um, like, there isn't like room for a toothpick when we're done. We, it's so filled with food. And then they said to Esther, now when you go north, drive really fast, don't stop for anything, get to the base and get out. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So wow, we have incredible. the bravest women. And sometimes Yehudid is able to go with her on these adventures. I do not have the nerves to be able to do this. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I can't do it. But you're Not in the yet. kitchen and managing the whole process. So we can't do everything and be everywhere. <laughs> no. And I and I, I tell my friends and and Alana will tell you, will conf, uh, what do they call it? Confirm this. I always say not every mitzvah has your name on it. So um that's not mine. Um, but I will gladly. But the payoff is the soldiers. So once a week we get um a video where they say, hello, Molly Adamim, and, you know, thank you so much, Bubby, or whatever. Um, and that, to me, is more than enough to keep me going. Like, you just pat me on the head. I'm, like, good to go for the next week. Um, we had a situation, I won't say his name, um, but uh, the commander comes out, and and they said, oh, where's the food from? And they said, Molly Adamim, he goes, I grew up there. And so Yehudi says, oh, you're so-and-so. I'm friends with your mother. <laughs> and um, we were able to feed him. That was so soul satisfying that we were able to, because these guys are eating corn and they're eating, you know, tuna. And and how many times can you have smoked tuna, really? Um, so they really look forward. One thing that they love is the brownies. So everybody fights to, to you know, Lisa Marcus is like amazingly making brownies for all these boys. And we're talking 350 guys, Matt, you know, 
Um, more units want us, but we we don't have the capacity. We need more chefs. We need more money. Um, I'm starting to fundraise for Rosh Hashanah. Um, it's going to be a three-day holiday. I already canceled my personal company. I, I said to them, guys, if I'm going to cook for the soldiers, you can't be here. Um, so because the refrigerator doesn't empty out until Friday morning. Can you imagine? Everything's full, 7.30 in the morning. Everything's empty. And then you have to start thinking about what you're going to do for your own Chabad house. <laughs> so, no. In, not, in this case, I'm no taking doubt. Rosh Hashanah. You especially can cope with that. I've no doubt about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But these are skills. When I was a young Rebbitzin, um, people used to say to me, why are you spending so much time with the sisterhood? Why are you down in the kitchen during services? The fact was, I was never good at davening. I was never good at, you know, at, uh, at the learning. And I mean, I try, but my my service in this Jewish life is meant to be service you know like i have to be hands-on it's it's you know it's my add it's my personality so um all these skills that i learned being a repetent all of these horrible things that i thought were so difficult at the time have now turned out to serve me during this wartime um choosing Amazing. to study resilience has really like centered me and you know so i learned about breathing and i learned about meditation and i learned about you know uh, staying positive and staying uh, you know listening to the minimum amount of news that i need to know um i learned about you know creating a positive environment so that when these boys come here friday night i had a soldier who had a sniper who had just come out of um gaza and he gave us the the full report of everything that was going on but what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is by making a positive environment, these boys want to come here. This is where they consider home base. And this is what I can do for the war effort. This is my, you know, when the, when our legacy, if any of you saw that amazing video put out by Michal Malamed's um, daughter-in-law, when our legacy is written and they, our grandchildren talk about what we did during this war, I think that we can all be really proud that we cooked, we prayed, we connected, we checked on people, we we encouraged self-care. We have a group of us that go to the pool and, you know, just float away all the problems in the world and solve the rest of the problems in the pool. Um, and we offered encouragement. And these are the most important things that I hope to be remembered for um, 120 years from now. <laughs> and um, and I thank you so much for letting me talk about something that I'm so passionate about, which is my soldiers. And and I thank my team because without people like Alana and Yehudit and Esther and Barbara Hirsch and all these amazing women from Mali Ajmim, we couldn't get this done. So oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yael, you are truly an inspiration to all of us. You've always been an inspiration. As I said, you've always been a bundle of energy and everything else. And you are a certain, certainly an example, and we've had many, but you are especially with this as well. Everyone in their own field, in their own pool, you are definitely an example of how every single one of us can make a difference and not to sit back and say, yes, somebody else will do it. Because that's what the majority of people do do in this world is that they sit back and say, no, well, someone else will take care of it. And you are definitely that example of being hands-on and doing it. And yes, I forgot to mention in your bio about the Babian Paul. I did plan on mentioning it later, and then you mentioned it. And that is incredible too, the fact that your own grandchildren, most of them are abroad. And so you came here and wanted to take on and be everyone else's Babi or Safta or however what's, you know, else you want to call it. And you, as you just summed it up, basically you're doing your, you're accumulating your lifelongs work in every single aspect and now focusing it on soldiers. And I also learned a couple of new things about you, which I didn't know as well. So, you know, you think you know someone and you know everything about them, but you don't. So, yeah, thank you so much for being our guest on the Monday Motivation Spotlight. For those of you that are live, joining live, do not log off. I'm going to officially end the recording very shortly of the Monday Motivation Spotlight, and then I'll tell you off the recording exactly what we're going to be doing. So thank you again for joining. Thank you, Yael. Thank you to our Coast ACI. I'm Leslie Kaplan, welcoming you every single Monday on the Monday Motivation Spotlight. So we will see you next week for then.
Bye. Have a great day. I'm Israel Chai, and carry on being resilient in the same words as Yale has used today.